Good evening. The storm has struck. Well, let's have a good evening, eh? Yeah? Let's get... Yeah, come on. Let there be no sense of formality about our work. I mean formality in the, in the sense of being formal. There is a formality, of course, but it's, uh, it's, it's a little friendlier than uh, we sometimes believe possible in this work. Actually, when we come together in a spiritual work, there is a much more intimate relationship between us than uh, there is in any other walk of life or any other strata of society. The spiritual life is a very personal one, a very intimate one. Sometimes we think of it as completely impersonal, and it isn't really that at all. The only impersonal thing about it is the universal nature of the life and of the truth and of the spirit. But it's really personal in that every universal or every cosmic law is personal to you and to me, and uh, the love that flows from the Father flows to everyone on the spiritual path. There's no such thing as strangers in uh, the household of God. There's no such thing as uh, old acquaintances and new acquaintances in the household of God. And that really is the essence of the message of the infinite way. Sometimes when we think of metaphysical teachings, we think of them more or less as healing teachings or uh, teachings having to do with the healing of uh, physical, mental, moral conditions. And uh, that isn't at all the truth about this work. The truth about this work is the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. The truth about this work is uh, God as your individual being and mind. God constituting your being and mind, making us all of the household of God. Now then. Once we perceive even a grain of this truth, there is that relationship that the Master understood when he spoke of the Father, later of the Father within me, the Father within me, my Father and your Father. Just think of this, my Father and your father. We have one father. If we have one father, we are brothers, we are sisters. We are the household of God. I am in you, you are in me, we are in God. All one. And you can see then that if you catch that, there is a warmth in this relationship that brings healing. Nothing less than one in our relationship will bring healing. There is no healing, no spiritual healing in coldness. There is no spiritual healing in aloofness. There is no spiritual healing in a me and mine and thine. There is only a spiritual healing in the warmth of a divine union, a divine oneness. Those who have experienced 
conscious union with God can tell you that not only there is the warmth of that feeling that the Master knew when he spoke of the Father within me, my Father and your Father, but there is even a greater warmth in our relationship with each other. Now, for us, the value of that lies in this, that even when we walk out into the street, even when we walk out into a world of what we call strangers, we're really not among strangers at all because we are not tabernacling with the flesh but with the soul of each individual as we meet them, whether it is in this room or whether it is in a streetcar or bus, train, steamer, airplane, we are never, never tabernacling with man and woman or male and female or flesh. Always there is an eternal and a constant recognition of the soul of each one of us talking to the soul of each one of us, and we can walk out of this room and feel that same relationship with those on the street, in the shops. Not only we can, eventually we must. The world is seeking peace. And uh, reading the newspapers, you'd hardly believe that the world has been seeking peace for 7,000 years. You would imagine reading the papers that that was quite a new search that the world was on, that it's only in this generation that we are seeking peace on earth. <clears throat> no, no, there has been no peace on earth for 7,000 years. There may have been none before that, for all we know. We only have a recorded history of about 7,000 years. And in that time, there has been no peace on earth. The world is seeking prosperity. And uh, sometimes when you hear of the good old days, you imagine that they had prosperity in those good old days, but that isn't true. It was in those good old days uh, that... Uh, in the good old days even that I remember that people were shot down for going on strike for a dollar and a half a day wages. Oh yes, there were workers not earning a dollar and a half a day in uh, my younger years, and some of them were actually killed, had militia called out and fired upon them for daring to strike for a dollar and a half a day wages. You imagine that. The good old days were really good old days. They were for some, as these days are good days, for some, as all days have been good for some. <clears throat> but so far as a universal good is concerned, it has never been experienced on earth. We have had not only three world wars, and a Spanish-American war, and a civil war, the War of 1812 and a Revolutionary War, but we have had a 30-year war, and we've had a 100-year war, and we've had religious wars throughout all time. Now then, while all of these wars were going on, while all of these discords and inharmonies, evil conditions of finance, evil conditions of church, evil conditions among men, even during those times there really were marvelous days and years on earth for those of spiritual vision. For those of spiritual vision there has always been health, harmony, wholeness, contentment, peace, joy, dominion. But as today so through all time, these good things of the world have only been found by those who sought them in spirit, not those who sought them in dollars, 
not those who sought them in lands or estates or possessions, not those who sought them in conquest or through ambition, but throughout all time those who have sought peace and goodwill through the Spirit have found it. And uh, you may be surprised, especially if you are a daily reader of newspapers, to learn that there are many, many, many thousands of people on earth today who have found peace who have found security, who have found safety, and healing, and health, and companionship. And these are the same people who have sought it in spirit, rather than in matter, have sought it in God, rather than in man. Herein lies the essence of the message of the Infinite Way. We find the fatherhood of God, and we find the brotherhood of man, the moment that we start seeking good in God, instead of an effect, instead of in or from each other. The moment we start seeking our good in God. Now, of course, the word God itself is misleading to most of the world, because the word God is associated with something that has probably been taught to uh, this world, to most of the world, in churches. And when we refer to God, we really have very little reference to uh, the God that is taught in churches or in church teachings, because the God uh, that we teach is an invisible, an infinite, a being, a presence, a power, but one that which must be experienced and not prayed to. Uh -huh. there, there we have uh, our Father which art in heaven, which art in uh, divine consciousness, which art in the consciousness of good. There we have uh, the Father that can make of us one brotherhood on earth. The moment we turn from the world's concept of God and turn rather to an invisible presence, but a presence within you, presence within me, a presence that we can look to within each other, not only within each other in this room. The moment we can look to an invisible presence in the soul of every individual on earth, whether they themselves are seeking God or not, that moment we are beginning to tabernacle with God and with the soul of man. That moment we are beginning to find God, because God is not to be found except in or as the very soul of man. And until we understand this, we have no part in finding our good in God. Let me illustrate this. You look up here, and uh, unless you have thought this out before, you may think that you see me up here. You may actually believe that you're seeing Joel up here, and you're not. And I, as I look out here, ordinarily might believe that I can see you. I know better. I learned long ago that I can't see you. I can't see you so far as my eyesight is concerned. I can see your form. I can see your figure your outline. I can't see you. And you know why? You are sitting way back there behind your eyes. That's where you are. Way behind your eyes. And you're looking up here at me. Your body isn't looking up here at me. That isn't you at all. The you that is looking up here is behind your eyes. And it's invisible. 
as far as my eyesight is concerned, and so are you. You are looking up here. You're not seeing me. You're seeing my form. I am way back here looking out at you. As far as you're concerned, I am invisible. Now, the moment that I perceive that, I begin to know the secret about you. I begin to know that there is a you, an invisible you, which is also an infinite and an eternal you. I know that there is an immortal you. There is that you which sits behind your eyes, which not even your mother has ever seen. And that is the you which constitutes you a true being, and that is the you which is the Son of God, the child of God, joined heir with Christ in God. And the moment that I recognize that, I am enabled to know that you are neither good nor bad, that you are neither sick nor well, that you are neither rich nor poor, you are neither white nor black, Jew nor Gentile. You are spiritual. You are pure, 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 infinite, eternal, spiritual being. And I only know that at that moment in which I realize that you're invisible and that it was the you that's looking up at me from behind your eyes, that is you. That is your true being. It isn't physical. I don't know. If you were to destroy this temple, if you were to destroy this physical edifice, this you that's there would still be there, and in far less than three days it would raise another temple for you. I have witnessed that. I have witnessed one who left this plane of uh, consciousness, passed through the experience we called death, and within six hours had built themselves a new edifice, a new temple, a new body. I witnessed that with my very eyes, my inner vision, the same vision with which I'm looking out here and not seeing the physical you, not seeing the form of you, but seeing the you which is you, which is eternal heir of God, joint heir with Christ in God. Now you can see why there can be peace on earth in this room. And the reason is I look out from here and I behold God shining through your eyes. I behold Spirit, the child of God, your true identity, that of you which is created in the image and likeness of God. I understand that to be your true being and identity, and in doing that, I can then say, Our Father, which art in heaven, your Father and my Father, we be brethren. We be of one blood, one relationship, one infinite household of God. Now, as I recognize that in you, you, of course, as students of truth, it makes no difference what your background may be as students of truth, no matter which school of metaphysics you have as a background, the mere fact that you have some school of metaphysics as a background, you know that my recognition of your true identity brings a response from within you. You know that. That's the secret of treatment. That's the secret of healing. That the moment there is this recognition, we witnessed that back in old when the Master said, Whom do men say that I am? Ah, they say you're just a resurrected Hebrew prophet. Yes, but who do ye say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And you as truth students, of course, you have got, and you do the same as I do, you say, you are the Christ, the Son of God the very living witness of his presence. Without you, <laughs> there'd be a void. There wouldn't be his presence. And so, 
the moment I, even as one, one with God is a majority, even I as one, looking out here and beholding the divine presence and realizing that Christ, God, God is manifest as Christ, as the individual Son, which is your true being, the moment I do that, you, in your turn, respond to it. And that response in you is health, harmony, and surprise. My up here, my recognition of your true identity, of your true being, results in what the world calls healing. It results in your responding with good health, good supply, good human relationships, peace on earth. In our case, it goes one step further, because as truth students, you know what's happening to you. You know that you are being witnessed or beheld in your true light. You are being seen as the Christ of God, and you know that, and you respond to that. Now then, out in the world, the world doesn't know what is happening when we go out and behold the Son of God. They only know one thing, we are friendly people. They only know that we are very nice people to do business with or to be neighbors to. They don't know why at first. They don't know why it is that we are comfortable to get along with. But sooner or later, they learn this. That first of all, we have recognized our true being. We have recognized God as our being. And therefore, we are assured of eternality and immortality, and so we've lost most of our fear of death. We have learned something of our true nature as heirs of God, and we have lost most of our fear of lack and limitation. We have recognized to some extent that God is the mind or soul of us, therefore whatever measure of success we have in life is really the activity of God in us, and so we've lost a measure of personal pride. We've lost a measure of personal pride in our success, and we've lost a measure of uh, our fear of failure. And this all means that we have found a degree of freedom. And so what the world recognizes, aha, here are some people who have found a measure of freedom. And of course, later they learn that in having found our own freedom, we are not holding them in bondage. We have now come to a place where we're not seeking that which they have. We're not envying what they have, we're not jealous of it, not desirous of it, not fearful in case it happens to be something evil or sick or sinful. And uh, in that degree, we are setting them free in the same spiritual freedom that we ourselves have found. Now, in the recognition of God as our true being, God as our true identity, in the recognition of our divine sonship, we have not only found our freedom, but we have found that which enables us to give our neighbor his freedom. And so as we walk out from this room, we carry the same relationship that we bear to each other, we carry that relationship out into the world with us. And so as we step into a taxi or train, ship, plane, we carry the realization of the fact that this isn't our neighbor, but that that which we are beholding in is our life. That is our neighbor, incorporeal, spiritual, perfect. Only in this wise do we establish peace on earth. There can be no peace on earth through covenants. There can be no peace on earth 
through agreements or institutions. There can be no peace on earth through disarmament. There can be no peace on earth in any way but one, and that one is in the recognition of God manifest on this earth. We find a passage in Scripture that tells us that the mystery, the mystery is God manifest in flesh. This is the mystery. This is the mystery of holiness. God manifest in flesh. The moment you perceive that, even in a measure that God is manifest in flesh, you have freed yourself from sin, from disease, from death, from lack, from limitation, and you already begin the freeing of your neighbor. Now watch this point. You never free yourself or anyone else from anything. And I say this to you and ask that you carry this message out with you within yourself. Never expect to be free from anyone or from any condition or from anything because there is no way to achieve such freedom. There is only a freedom in, a freedom in spirit. You are free in spirit when you know that spirit is the source of your life, your health, your body, your wealth, your supply, your human relationship, you are free in spirit. The moment that you express a thought such as a freedom from, you are acknowledging the reality of an evil. You see, therein, therein has the world failed. If God created all in the beginning, and all that God created is good, and God pronounced it good, there's nothing to be free from. And there's no one to be freed from, even though uh, you may look at each other and say, yes, there is the appearance of husband, wife, relative, in-law to be freed from. But it isn't true. It isn't true. There is a sin to be freed from. It isn't true. There is a false appetite or desire to be freed from can't be true. Not if the uh, Genesis is true. God created all that was made, and all that God made is good, and uh, anything that God did not make was not made. Now then, you perpetuate your own prison as long as you seek freedom from a person, a condition, a thing, or a circumstance. But you attain your freedom, that is, you attain the realization of it, you already have it, but you attain the realization and demonstration of it the moment that you realize, yes, freedom is in spirit, in truth, not from. Spirit is always free. Freedom is always in and of spirit. Now watch. You may believe for a moment. No, you may go further than belief. You may add the actual human experience of walking around on a battlefield, right in the midst of a heavy engagement, and think that that would be a wonderful place to be freed from. You'd be surprised how many people have found uh, freedom right in that very place. Have found freedom, safety, and security right in the midst of the battlefield or the bursting bombs, found freedom in them. Yes? Oh, let's take up scripture for a minute. God is a high tower. God is an abiding place. God is a fortress. God is a rock. The world has interpreted that to mean that God has provided us with a rock or a fortress or a high tower or a dwelling place, and it isn't true. God is itself. 
the rock, the high tower, the fortress, and uh, we hide in God. We find our freedom in God. We can walk right around on the street in the midst of what the world would call danger, and we can experience no danger because we're not on the street, we're in God. We're in spirit, even though God is invisible. There again, you see, the world is seeking safety and security and peace, but they're seeking them in the external. There are people even now buying a bomb-proof shelter. There are people right now preparing themselves, believe this or not, preparing themselves to go out on the street and save the wounded when the bombs come. There are people right now carrying registration cards so that their bodies can be identified. Right now they're being given out in certain agencies of the government. Believe it or not, in spite of the fact that in this enlightened age everyone must know that there is no safety, no more security outside in things than there is peace in covenants. There is safety and security and peace inside, inside your realization of your true identity. This jewel that you see shining out through my eyes can't ever be in any danger because it's invisible. There isn't a bowed bullet that could find it because the jewel isn't visible or physical or external. And neither is the Bill or the Mary or the Florence or the John. They're not visible. They're not tangible to sense. We are invisible being. We are the Christ of God. And it is in that truth that we are hidden, that we, are, that we find our freedom and our peace and our safety and our security. Now, the whole of the message of the infinite way is nothing but a revelation of this truth, of this statement of truth, of this unfoldment of truth. The whole of the message of the infinite way consists of God as the infinite invisible, of man as the infinite invisible, of individual you and me as infinite, invisible, eternal, immortal, and indestructible ageless, sinless, and pure. And any other concept of yourself that you entertain must be given up. And that is the work of the message of the infinite way, to help you give up the false concept of yourself that was given you at birth and with which you have grown up until even now you believe that you are sitting in a chair and before you get home there may be a storm to interfere with your progress in, uh, and safety in arriving there. Don't ever believe it. There isn't any storm going to come up that can deprive you of your comfort or your safety or your security or your peace of mind because you are not outside in a belief of matter. You are inside in the indestructibility of your God-given nature. God is your being, and your being is eternal. There's only one reason why we have met together in the message of the infinite way. There's only one reason why we have class instruction, and that is for the further unfoldment and revelation of this one truth. Unfortunately, stating this truth or writing it does not, in and of itself, always make it demonstrable. There is a further step, and that step is spiritual discernment of truth. In other words, the natural man receiveth not the things of God. And just to tell you this, from the mind to the mind may not demonstrate it for you. But in proportion as I am lifted up, I lift up those to that same level of consciousness where they can apprehend a spirit.
spiritual truth and thereby demonstrate it. The reason for having practitioners is this. The truth, as you read it in the writings, is the truth for all, and therefore everyone should be a practitioner. In course of time, everyone will be, meaning that there will be no practitioners since everybody will be their own practitioner. But until that time, there will be practitioners and teachers, and the answer to that is this. There are some who receive this spiritual light a little sooner than others, and those who receive it are enabled by virtue of having received it to be the light to the others coming on that path. In other words, when a Jesus is spiritually endowed, it makes it possible for him to be a healer to those not yet spiritually endowed. Then in proportion, as he raises up disciples and apostles, they in their turn may become healers, reformers, redeemers unto others not yet at that level. Even in those days, there were those that the disciples couldn't heal, and uh, they had to go to the Master. So we have in this day. There are those who are very far ahead of us on the spiritual path and can do healing works of which we are not capable. And then there are some right here in this room capable of healing works such as others cannot yet aspire to. And so it is that there are states and stages of this developed or natural spiritual consciousness, and in proportion as you attain one level after another, you lift others up unto that very level. I'm, I'm thinking I see a young lady out here, and uh, I cannot help going back through the years, to a time when my business seemed to be going, getting very bad, and I sought the help of practitioners. And uh, the more these practitioners worked for me, the worse my business got, in spite of the fact that I went to very good practitioners. And uh, then, having gone to the best I could uh, find, and found that my business was still uh, going further down here, I guess instead of seeking advice, I just spoke to this young lady as a friend and said, I just do not understand it. I can't figure it out. The more work we have done, the worse my business gets. And she said, have you ever thought that you might be a practitioner, that you ought to be in the practice? And uh, oh, no, not I, surely not. Not any, no fate like that for me. But you see, she was right and I was wrong. One week later I was in the practice and have been ever since. And uh, happy to see her here tonight. It illustrates in my mind this very point, that there is always a specific, let us call it time, it actually isn't time or space. It's a state of consciousness, but it's a state of consciousness realized in time, at which we do rise above a physical sense of existence, at least to the extent that we can apprehend a spiritual reality, and it is in that apprehension that one becomes a practitioner, not in merely knowing the truth not in merely reading the truth in book. That's the point I'm making, that this knowing the truth must go a step beyond uh, mental enlightenment or mental knowledge before it becomes a healing practice, a healing consciousness. So it is. Our work in uh, teaching this is not so much the imparting of the letter although that is a valuable part of it, but more 
particularly an enriching of spiritual consciousness, and that is accomplished by two or more of us being together in one place of one mind, seeking one thing, the realization of God. Well, it is to this activity, to this goal, that we dedicate ourselves in this lecture work and in our class work. Every lecture and every class must be an unfoldment of spiritual truth from divine consciousness unto itself. I ask of those who come to these lectures and those who come to the classes to come in this spirit, that you are not coming to be taught of man or by man. Do not come in any sense that you are coming to a human teacher to be taught something because you will miss the main part of the entire work. If you come, whether to a lecture or to a class, in the, the expectancy that you are coming to be in the company of two or more who come to be enlightened of God, you will receive your enlightenment, whether or not it comes through a man through a teacher. We had an experience of that recently where one of our students during a class was taking notes and at one point was struck very forcibly with something that came through and uh, it remained in her consciousness throughout the day, throughout the night. And the next day she returned to her notes to find the exact wording of it, and there wasn't one single word about it in the notes. And then when she came and asked me about it, I hadn't even mentioned it. So you see, again it was revealed that having come to receive truth, she received it. She received the truth that she came for, but it was given her directly in her own consciousness since it wasn't at that moment coming through my lips. Now, it isn't necessary for you to receive truth through my lips. You may, you may, because of the preparation, the days, the weeks, the months, the years that have gone into the uh, preparation of consciousness for this work, you may receive this truth through my consciousness. But if not, you will receive it directly within you, as long as you understand that we all come together for that purpose. I am in this room for the same purpose that you are, to be spiritually illumined. There never has been a time, and there never will be a time in my experience, when I have any other purpose in life than that of being and becoming spiritually illumined. I have nothing of myself to give you, and I know that all of our students know that as they go out into this world, they have nothing of themselves to give, nor must they store up yesterday's manna to give to you tomorrow. Each day the manna must fall fresh. Each day God must impart itself in me, through me, as me, to you. Each day you must look not to what you learned here yesterday, but to what God imparts to you today. The whole purpose of this class instruction is to awaken you to the fact that each day, each hour of your experience, you can be spiritually illumined, not by going back to the class, not by going back to your notes, but by opening your consciousness to the omnipresence of divine illumination. Never forget that. The whole purpose of this work is to reveal to you your spiritual identity, to reveal to you your sonship in Christ, to reveal to you your conscious union, oneness with God, so that at every moment of every day, wherever you may be, 
you will be spiritually open to receive heavenly manna, divine guidance, spiritual supplies, spiritual wisdom, spiritual illumination, and all of that without mediation. As a direct relationship, as your direct relationship, with through in God. Now one thing before you go. Take this. This is the thing as it comes through. In spirit it is your peace, your health, your safety, your security, your eternality. Watch out that you are not expecting it through some outer source, through something external to your own being. Watch what I'm saying because this is a message for this particular evening. Watch that as you go out of here you understand that your peace, your supply, your health, your wholeness, your completeness, your perfection, safety, security is in and through the invisible. Never look for it in anyone or in anything that is visible. Otherwise you will be worshipping the creature more than the Creator. Now remember, in God is your allness. In the Spirit is that peace which passeth understanding. In the Spirit is, uh, oh, it's your abiding place. We live and move and have our being in God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, he that dwelleth. He that lives there, he that consciously is in God, is in safety, security, harmony, wholeness, perfection, and the allness of being. Now, we have only one thing more. If you abide in this word, and if you let this word abide in you, then will you demonstrate it? If you hold this truth in your consciousness, if you let this truth remain with you day and night, write it up here on the forehead, put it on the, your armband, keep close to you the realization that your good is in spirit and not spirit. Don't look to an outside God any more than you look to an outside bomb proof shelter. But look to this truth maintained in your consciousness. If you abide in my word, this is the 15th chapter of John, if you abide in this word, if you let this word abide in you, the 91st Psalm, if you live and dwell in the secret place, in the secret word of the Most High, keep this word nigh unto you, keep it close to you, keep it consciously, active within you, you will always be in God and God will always be in you, inseparable and indivisible. The sense of separation comes when you let the Word of God outside of you. When you drop the Word of God and forget it even for a day. My peace I give unto you. My peace I give unto you. The Christ peace. My peace I give unto you. Abide with it and let it abide with you. Never let it part from your consciousness and then you will find that you are living in eternality. You are living in immortality. You will never know death. No one ever knows death who has the word of life in their consciousness. No one ever knows I have never seen a righteous man begging bread. Who is a righteous man? A good human being? No. Those who abide in the Word and let the Word abide in them. That is it. Thank you.